next news as it happens. Next scheduled news at 11 o'clock over WOR Radio 710, The Talk of New York. And here's Gene Shepard. That's a classic. It certainly is. You know, speaking of classics, uh, we're all part of it. I, I, I've, I've wanted to, uh, I've wanted to take this night. Uh, this is the uh, beginning of the week, and all. I wanted to uh, salute one of the great, uh, one of the truly great uh, uh, characters out of uh, out of literature. Now, I can't say he's actually fiction because I've worked for him, and that's Scrooge, Ebenezer. Uh, yeah, really. Uh, he's a great character, and I and I. For those of you who uh, who all know his work and his, you remember his famous line, don't you? What what was his famous line? What, what's he known for? That's right, Bah Humbug. Now, uh, how many of you know what he was referring to when he used that phrase humbug? What does the word humbug mean? What is its derivation? Why did he use the term humbug? What is a humbug? Is it a bug that hums? A humbug. Well, that that has a very, very interesting uh, history, that word, humbug. Uh, how it came to be used, and why Scrooge used it in that particular sense. It was a very apt word. Bah, humbug, was what he said. Now, uh, how many of you remember the name of his partner, you're you're quite right, Barley. Uh, he he was. Uh, and what business was he and Barley in? What were what was their business? You recall they had an office, and uh, and and he and Barley had uh, built this business from scratch, and uh, now in his old age, uh, Mr. Stooge and Barley. Uh, of course, uh, were successful men. And what was their business? What did they do? Did they sell steel-belted radial tires? No. You start eliminating things. Did they? Were they? Uh, were they in the insurance business? No, they were not. Were they solicitors? Were they lawyers? No, they were not. What was their business? Now, that's a good question. Now, he had several employees. 
Now, one of the most notorious of the employees was the one who worked in Mr. Stooge's office. By the way, how many of you know that that, that Stooge himself, uh, that his name entered the language? We 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 even use that phrase. He, uh, yeah, the, the phrase Stooge is a, is from that work. Uh, now, who was his partner? Okay, Barley. We we decided that. Who was his his clerk? What was the name of his clerk? Well, uh, maybe maybe uh, maybe I'll give you a clue better than that. All right, that's right. He had a daughter named Becky. His daughter's name was Becky Thatcher. So the father's name was Bob Thatcher. You recall? And uh, they had she had this little brother. And what was the what was the no, that's right. Uh, Tiny Tim, correct. And what was Mr. Tim's, what was Tiny Tim's affliction? And he was, yes, but what kind of an illness did he have? It's not enough just to say he was a cripple. What was his problem? Because you know, if you recall the story, later on he recovered. So uh, what, what, what was the illness that he was suffering from at the time? that rendered him a cripple, as we call it, as it was called in the uh, poor tiny Tim. And uh, he propelled himself about on his crutches, right? And uh, his family, of course, Bob Bob Thatcher and uh, his family, uh, were, were about to celebrate Christmas Eve. Now, what, uh, what were they going to celebrate it with? What was their... Do you recall what their... Uh, their... Uh, their Christmas celebration was to be before Mr. Stewart stepped in and changed all that? What was it? Now, now why, why uh, this is very important, because it's part of the, it's part of the uh, whole, uh, whole uh, Christmas legend, uh, as, as was created by the writer. Do you recall who the writer was? was not, I'll give you a clue. It was not Tolstoy. Um... Uh, Charles Lamb, you're right. Uh, and now this was a this was a, I think I think uh, probably the, it's very difficult to know whether that story created Christmas or whether it reflected Christmas. People often say that that uh, that Christmas came into being when this guy finished writing his stuff. That after that, people started to do all those things, uh, you know, ho ho and Merry Christmas to all and a Merry New Year and all that sort of thing. That they never really did that before he wrote all this stuff and. Uh, and so it came into being as a result of his writing. Now, uh, I, I uh, of course, see, part of our, our tradition goes back in, in many ways to, to all kinds of, uh, you might say, literature, folk literature in some cases, that makes up what you could call Western culture. For example, nursery rhymes. We all know them, and yet we never can, we, we can't really remember when we didn't know them. You can't remember actually learning uh, for example, about uh, little Jack Warner sat in the corner eating his curds and whey. We all know this. When did you first uh, memorize this? You can't remember that. Humphrey Dumpty sat on the wall. Call that. Uh, all these things uh, are part of what we call uh, the Western tradition, the Western survival. I imagine eventually future generations of kids will argue back and forth the existence of or the non-existence of or the mythical character of uh, or the, the, let's say, the mythical ramifications of the Red Rider BB gun, future generations. <laughs> That's the way it works, you know. Uh, I'm sure that the, that the writer, who uh, when he finished knocking off uh, uh, the story of, uh, of Ebenezer and his partner Barley, had no idea that it would eventually become a great classic tradition that uh, hundreds of years from now uh, people would still be talking about that. He sat at his roll-top desk. He had a roll-top desk, right? And uh, and there was a big argument about raising the heat or not raising the heat in the office at one point. Do you remember uh, poor old Bob came in and he he he, uh, he stoked up the fire, and uh, Ebenezer came in and roared uh, angrily. Now, what was Ebenezer's sister's name? She played a role in the uh, story. You don't know, recall that? Uh, you recall her being there, though. Uh, when, when the, remember when the when the voice said, "I am the spirit of Christmas past," and the next thing you know, poor old Ebenezer is transported back into the past, and uh, there he is. 
He's he's a little kid, <laughs> you remember, <laughs> and he's at school, uh, and uh, you can see how he turned into being such an irascible, rotten person, right from the beginning. There, he was having troubles right in, right in the very beginning. I am the story of Christmas. Well, well, uh, we are all turned into those things from one what we are by little subtle things that happen to us from time to time. Now, for those of you that are involved in Christmas, give me a little uh, a, a little jingle bells here to set the mood, please. Yes. Please. That's good. Jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Hey, now, there's an argument whether it's a shay or a sleigh. Which do you think? You say sleigh? One-horse open sleigh? Well, I've heard it pronounced both ways. So they say sleigh. Of course, they're New York singers. They do not know there is such a thing as a shay, a one-horse open shay. They probably don't know that. symbolic uh, jingle bells is to us and in the true sense of the word symbolic not many people who are within the sound of my voice ever rode in a sleigh drawn by a horse did you ever mark how about you i never did either so so it's a symbolic thing we're singing there oh uh, you know can you imagine riding in a one horse open sleigh if you prefer to your grandmother's house on utopia parkway uh, you would cause a little talk, especially going through the Midtown Tunnel. Uh, I, I don't know whether or not uh, uh, a sleigh could make it all the way through there. But uh, uh, this is symbolic. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. You know the rest of the words. Of course, I must say that uh, in high school we had a whole different set of words that uh, did not necessarily say what the song originally said. And since there are kids up and around at this hour, we better not sing them. Uh, what with, uh, you know, the blue-nosed sales department uh, always worrying about the, <laughs> that problem. On the other hand, do you, do you recall ever... At, 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 do, you, do you ever look back uh, on... on uh, Christmas, they always say, is a time for looking back. And I don't mean looking back in anger nor looking back in nostalgia. Just looking back. It is. Uh, they say that this is one of the main reasons for holidays in a man's mind. Man, man in general, man. That includes women, everybody. Excuse me. A person's, uh, right? Uh, a human being's. A hue person. we got to cut that last M-A-N out of there. It's a hue person. Uh humano person so when when you look back uh, why do you have holidays well they say that one of the reasons is because holidays in a sense give us a very definite feeling of uh, i suppose you might say the fluidity of life in your daily life you don't get this it's just one day and then the next and then all of a sudden the holiday arrives and you are very aware of the passage of time you say such things as do you remember last christmas you don't say, do you remember Wednesday, October 15th? That's hardly ever unless you're in trouble, and there's a district attorney asking you that. Uh, so uh, the holidays are like buoys, B-O-U-Y, buoys that float in a channel. If you can imagine your life as a channel, existence is a channel, not your life specifically, but it's a channel, uh, a channel. Uh, of water. The water is, 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 is an invisible channel, and this water is rushing along, and, uh, and it is marked off by buoys, <laughs> these little floats that are there. And all of us go past the buoy at the same time, so we can refer to, uh, I can say to you, do you remember, uh, well, let's just take a, do you remember Fourth of July? And yes, we all experienced Fourth of July this year, in one way or another. Not the same, but we, we didn't experience the same identical things, on, but we remember Fourth of July. So if I say to you, last Christmas, you immediately think of last Christmas. So you do this even subconsciously. And so, do you ever look back when, when you, you know, back to when, say for example, when you were a kid, just take that part of your life. Do you remember... A, a Christmas gift you gave somebody as a kid? 
let's let's just take an arbitrary age. Let's say eight. Do you recall a Christmas gift you gave at about that time of your life to somebody? You must have had people around you. Do you recall giving a gift? Oh, come on. You're not really thinking. Yes, you can. You, it is there. It is not, there's no such thing as it's too long ago. It's all stored away there. What, I'm, what you are not doing is trying. That's the thing. Most people do not try to recall anything, so then they assume they can't recall. You hear the two recent cases of uh, in, in, in the police department somewhere where they got guys to remember things that had happened to them by hypnosis? Well, that meant that it was always there in their head. The trick is getting it out, so don't say to me, I don't remember. That's not true. You do remember. You can't get it out. Now, one of the reasons you can't get it out is you're not concentrating. It takes concentration. Most people don't know how to concentrate. Do you know this is a, uh, a an actual study concentration? You know how people study to meditate? They learn how to meditate? Well, I would like to suggest to you that, that this is one thing all good actors and all good performers have studied and worked on and learned, the, the, the thing called concentration. Now, most people think they concentrate, but uh, they've not experienced them the real thing. You know, the genuine concentration literally cuts almost totally the rest of the world out from around you. And, in fact, when I'm on stage or when I'm performing, there is no other world. I've had to learn this uh, over the years. As you, you just focus your mind till it's a fine point down like a, like a fine light that's been adjusted, some kind of a special laser beam. It's the difference between a wide light, just a light bulb hanging that just, that, that just spreads its light in all directions, and nothing is really lit up. It's just uh, general light. That's the way most people's minds work. But if you learn to focus the light down, you put a retina, you put a lens in front of it, until finally it's a fine, tiny dot of very concentrated light, and there's no other light anywhere else. It's all black all around. It's called concentration. Not an easy thing to learn. <laughs> no way. Uh, in fact, many people never quite can learn it. Stanislavski's all about that. Uh, the method, the, they refer to it as the method. It comes from intense, total concentration. And your life is there. It's, it, it's all in your head. Uh, if, if some Every last day of your life is somewhere tucked away. <laughs> it's hard to believe it, but it's all stacked up in there. <laughs> and, and, and oddly enough, uh, you can generally remember if you're if you if you're honest about your memory, you can generally remember things that were further back uh, easier than you can things, let's say, two or three years ago. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that because, for one thing, they made a bigger impression on you. Uh, this is a one theory: bigger impression because you hadn't experienced anything like that before. Uh, so it was a big impression. So like the, the first time you go to a play uh, when you're, say, 10 years old, is going to make a real impression on you, but the 538th time you go to a play is just another play. So that's, you know, it's, it's a logical thing to think that way. But now, to ask you a question here, do you recall a Christmas gift, a specific gift you gave to somebody when you were 8 or 9? You do. You don't, Al. You, you, you think you can't remember? You, you, you had parents, I presume. Now, you, do you recall giving? Or wasn't maybe in your family a tradition for the kids to give anybody a gift? They just got gifts. Is that it? You didn't have that tradition? Oh, well, then you didn't do it. So that, that was your answer. You did not give a gift to your mother. Well, did you ever give a gift to your mother? How old were you when you started that? Were you a teenager after that, before that? So, uh, <laughs> well, we, we, uh, <laughs> that's fascinating when you think about it. This is WOR New York. And, and I, I, this tonight's show, by the way, is about a gift. But now when I look back on it, I can't tell whether it's, it was a sad scene or whether it was funny or what. But I gave a gift, and I, and I, to this day, I can remember the feelings about that specific gift I gave. And uh, before we go any further, I'll give you a little gift here. If you're, 
seriously thinking of coming into New York uh, over the Christmas holidays, I would like to give you a personal recommendation for a very fine restaurant that's been an old uh, friend of mine for a long time, and it's a good restaurant at this time of the year especially. It's the Blue Ribbon. Uh, they have, uh, for example, roast goose at this time of the year. This is the time. Christmas roast goose is a traditional middle European dish, and you can't get it in many places in New York. And I would highly recommend the roast goose at the Blue Ribbon. All the Christmas, uh, they have Christmas breads and cookies and all that stuff. It's a German restaurant, and they really do it well because it's all, they all, all the baking and everything is done right there. And it's an excellent restaurant with imported uh, German beers and so on. But for a, a really great meal, if you're coming in to, to shop or something between now and Christmas, or you're coming in for Christmas, uh, you know, before Christmas, something like that, uh, and you're looking for a good place midtown to have dinner, something extraordinarily interesting, I would suggest the Blue Ribbon at 145 West 44th Street. And they're open Monday through Saturday, and they're open until midnight, and uh, from 1130 in the morning to midnight. And give them a call. Ask them if they have the uh, roast goose uh, at the time you go down there. It's JU2-4898. Did you know that there's a worldwide shortage of roast of geese? That is a, a fact. And you know why this is so? The geese is a uh, goose is a very large bird, as you know, uh, and the goose is a is a bird that uh, it's expensive to feed a goose. They're an expensive feeder, uh, and so a goose is a very expensive bird to raise, and uh, so and also uh, it's a difficult bird to cook correctly, to properly prepare. Now, a turkey or a chicken is very simple, but a goose has to take very special type of preparation. And uh, so today, it's almost impossible for many restaurants to even get geese. They have to order them months in advance. Many of them are European that they get. They get imported geese. So uh, nevertheless, this is the Blue Ribbon, 145 West 44th Street here in Manhattan. And the number is JU24898. And ask for Big George. Someday you'll own, someday you'll own, sooner or later you'll own General. Okay, General Tire, and uh, if you're riding around on thin rubber and you need yourself a new set of wheels, I would like to suggest you go down to your General Tire dealer, because they have these elegant steel-belted beautiful glass belt gripper tires and they're having a big sale too and don't forget their slogan you go in snow or we pay the tow and that's a guaranteed tow guaranteed traction it's what you get from good old gt general tires check your yellow pages and as you do it sing that on phone uh, Schlesinger is one of America's great stores for men and boys in West New York, New Jersey. Invites you to choose from selected groups of over 10,000 famous name suits and overcoats and sport coats and all the rest of that great stuff. At ordinary, uh, unbelievable savings, extraordinary savings. You'll find every garment from Schlesinger's current selections of 3G's, Louis Roth, Hickey Freeman, Hamilton Park, Herb, uh, Hart Schaffner and Marks, and a host of other top names. Anyway, that's Schlesinger's out in New Jersey, and there are all kinds of sales uh, going on out there and a lot of savings. Schlesinger's, Bergen Line Avenue at 58th Street in West New York, New Jersey, one of America's great stores for men and boys since 1899. My name is Ebenezer Scrooge. Have you got a candy for me? Our name is Schraffs, and have we got a candy for you. So roll your eyes and pat your tummy, lick your lips, cause yum, yum, yum. Have we got a candy for you? A chocolate cream and a cherry dream, a jelly slice and a drop with ice, a crispy nut and a coconut. Whether you 
like your candy, sweet or sour, hard or soft, crispy or creamy, Schraff's has it all wrapped up for Christmas. From a little bag of Schraff's Starlights to a gold chest of Schraff's chocolates. Well, pat my tummy. Yeah, hey, there's a mispronunciation on that, although that's, a, an, a, I imagine, an artistic mispronunciation. That is not a non-pareil. Did you hear that, Sonny? She says, we've got uh, all the candy. It's a non-pareil. That's a... <laughs> you know what kind of candy a non-pareil is? Sure, no. Although I suppose some people could call it a non-pareil. It doesn't matter. Six of one, half a dozen, as they always say on the Groucho Marx show. However, uh, on the on the uh, subject, though, of, of the gift, I'll tell you... Uh, uh, I, I remember kids, kids, you know, kids read ads, and they're very impressed by ads. Uh, I think kids are more impressed by ads than grown-ups. I, as, as a matter of fact, I think we all are, ultimately, whether we like to believe it or not. And it's all a matter of how it's sold. And so you see this very elegant ad, uh, and it, it just assures you that... Uh, that the, you're an extraordinary human being, and if you are an extraordinary human being, of course you'll own a, a Rolls. Uh, <laughs> and all these, you know, this is, we're all a subject, especially to to a, a specific type of flattery. And uh, it's very difficult to know at one point uh, in your life when you're making a real decision or whether you've been convinced that that's the decision that you should make. Uh, this is called fashion. Uh, fashion is is a subtle thing. Uh, who knows why? A lot of people who have long hair don't like it because it itches. Uh, and I know people who say that, but they have it. On the other hand, uh, so it's it's it, we're herd animals. And so as a kid, I remember we used to get this magazine all the time. My mother's a great magazine reader, and it was Woman's Home Companion. You remember that magazine, Woman's Home Companion? See, is it still around? I don't know. Woman's Home Companion. And uh, my mother got the Woman's Home Companion. She got the Saturday Evening Post. And she was always reading uh, the Saturday Evening Post, Woman's Home Companion. She also got Cosmopolitan and Red Book. <laughs> she was always, re that was the one, Red Book. And, and we, were told, we were always getting Red Book. She, she really liked Red Book. And uh, so, uh, you know, when you're a kid, you look at these things once in a while and and uh, I was, I remember looking at, it was either Red Book or Cosmopolitan, and there was an ad, I can still recall, it was only a, it was a quarter page ad that ran down the side of one page, and it was before Christmas. And it says, uh, give him, um, and it was a, a little dotted line, and it shows this, this real father looking guy, he had slippers and a whole bit, and he's sitting in this, this uh, leather chair. I don't know any father who does all those things, but this is a, the, 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 legendary father sits in a leather chair and has slippers all the time in front of a roaring fire. We had no fireplace. We did not have a leather chair. And I don't recall my old man ever wearing slippers. Uh, he certainly never wore checkered shirts, you know, the woodsman type shirt. But they always showed the father in a woodsman type checkered shirt. And uh, he's a classic character, the father. He has a crinkly look around the eyes. And uh, it says, give him a little dotted line. It shows this guy sitting there looking very contented. And uh, underneath it, it says, Give him a friend for Christmas this this year. A friend. And it says, And the friend of, your, of, of the man around the house that he will really appreciate is a new pipe. <laughs> and, uh, and there it was. See? And, I, and somehow that was very romantic to me. See, I'm reading, I, I, reading this ad, and I see this guy sitting there, and he's got this pipe. Well... Um, something clicked in my head. I was a kid, see, so I, I, I said, so I, yeah, that's a great gift. I think I'm, I'm going to give, uh, I, you know, I'm going to give the old man a pipe. Now, there was a tradition in our family that you didn't tell anybody else in the family what you were going to give to somebody. So I didn't immediately go to my mother and say, hey, I'm going to give the old man a, a football or, uh, you know, I'm going to give the old man a, uh, you know, a new skyrocket for Christmas, anything like that. It was supposed to be a surprise. You know, I'm going to get him a, a pipe. Now, I had no idea what pipes cost or anything like that. I just knew that a pipe was a great thing that for a, may, a man, a father to have. Not a man, a father. You think of him in terms of he's a father. So 
So, however, it was not against the rules or against the tradition to mention what you're going to get to other kids. So uh, I'm, I'm uh, you know, hanging around out in the back there, and I, I, I was thinking about this for a couple of days, about this pipe. And there was a picture of this guy. He had a pipe. Now, his the specific pipe that he had was a uh, classic cut pipe, and it had a... a um, it had a, a, a bowl on it that was uh, of very dark wood. I remember the picture. It was a dark wood bowl. And it had a rather long stem, the one that he was smoking, and it had a little silver band around the middle of it. And it looked to me from the picture that the, that the stem of the bowl, the, the, the stem of the pipe, you know, the, the mouthpiece of the pipe, was of some light material. It looked like it was white-like. It was kind of... A, uh, I don't know what it was supposed to be. I suppose it was Meerschaum or something. I don't know. But this pipe, it was advertised in Red Book, so obviously it was not an El Cheapo. But uh, it's a great-looking pipe. And this guy was sitting there smoking a pipe. So I figured I'm going to get a pipe. And I'm out in the back and talking about gifts. And Schwartz said he was going to get his father a belt. He was going to get him a belt that had his initials on it. Now, uh, I said, his initials, what are you going to have, F for father? What, what, what is your initial, you know? He's going to have, <laughs> he's going to have an S on it, Schwartz. I said, well, what kind of a belt? Now, now all kids think in terms of, of a belt with an initial on it. That's a, uh, there was a time when everything had to have an initial. And uh, he, he had picked it, already picked out the belt that he was going to get. It was, had a belt, buck, a belt, and it came with a matching tie clip with an initial on it. And, uh, you know, it was probably a fantastically rotten-looking belt buckle, but he was going to get that anyway because it had an initial, and he liked it because it was chrome and it was shiny. And uh, he figured his old man would really like it because he didn't have any shiny belt buckles. Well, if you knew Schwartz's old man, you would know that Schwartz's old man wore suits that were made of black sandpaper all of his life. He was totally, uh, you, know, you could see, he, he was totally not the the uh, chromium belt buckle type, especially with initials on it, but Schwartz was going to get him one. So we're back there talking about what we're going to get. And uh, Flick decided what he was going to get his old man. He was going to get him a pair of mittens. And he was going to get a special kind of leather mittens. He figured that those would really be great uh, because his father went out in the back a lot and worked on a car. Well, now, it never occurred to the kid, probably, that it's not very easy to work on a car when you got a pair of leather mittens on, but that was a great idea. So, so he's going to get the mittens, and I was going to get a pipe, right? Well, we, we, we all went Christmas shopping. The three of us went. Did you ever go Christmas shopping with your buddies when you were a kid? Yeah, you know, we were all down. We went downtown. We took the bus. We went right into town. And all these big departments. Now, don't think for a minute this was a little town. No way. These are big department stores. There was Sears Roebuck store, the giant department store. There was a there was a great big store called Goldblatt's. There was another store called uh, uh, the Fair Store. These are big department stores. So we're riding into town. We get off. We walk down this. You know, we walk right down the main stem there, right from all the department stores, figuring out where we're going to get this belt buckle. Man. Well, well. Schwartz knew where he was going to get the belt buckle right away. He had seen it. He knew where the belt buckle was. So we took care of him first. We went down to Goldblatt's, down, down in the basement there, and Schwartz. First of all, the guy says, well, what size do you want? Well, it never occurred to Schwartz that there were sizes of belts. So, you know, when you're a kid, you don't think in terms of what size belt. We are a kid size belt, that's all. You know, there's a... Uh, so there was a lot of palavering back and forth between Schwartz and this guy behind the counter, and they finally decided to get him this belt. And Schwartz, of course, like all kids, thought his father was about 15 sizes bigger than he was. So Schwartz says he's really big, you know, oh, wow. And so anyway, we, we must have bought a, maybe a 56 size belt. Uh, Schwartz actually, the old man was about 5 feet 3, weighed about 102 pounds probably lucky if he wore a 29 belt, you know, after a, after a Thanksgiving dinner. But we had a belt that would have stretched halfway across the street. So Schwartz, you know, he's very proud of the belt. So out we go with the belt. Well, now, Flick, <laughs> Flick, got it. Flick got the mittens in the hunting department of Sears Roebuck. And, uh, you know, so, and it's always a big deal because this each one of these gifts absolutely destroyed us for our life savings. Now, I had been saving 
you know, I've been saving my life savings for years, and I had, oh, my life savings totaled roughly a dollar ten. And uh, that included I was going to get a, a rubber dagger for my kid brother or a tank or something. And I, and I had already picked out what I was going to get for my mother, which incidentally was, a, was an atomizer uh, for perfume. She still has it. And it's, 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 even at this date, it's such an obscene, rotten-looking atomizer, which I thought was great-looking. It, it was artificial pearl. <laughs> and, and she still has it. She never shows it him. It's, 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 it's carefully concealed, but she keeps it for sentimental reasons, certainly not for atomizing reasons. So, anyway, uh, I, I, I wanted to get this pipe. See, I had all, all in my mind separated on how much it was going to be. Now, I was figuring this was going to be the big Christmas for my father, the big one. I was going to get him a big... So the, the bulk of my dough was going to go on, on him. I figured that I could go at least 75 cents. At least. I could go to 85 if I was really going to push it, really, really going to push hard. So we went... <laughs> we went to this big tobacco store there. There was a big cigar store. They have millions of pipes in the window. See, so I go into the store with, with Schwartz and Flick. I go up to the counter, and I still remember the guy says, Oh, you, you have a very good idea. You're, you're thinking of a pipe for your father. So I said, Yes. So he said, Well, what, the, what sort of a man is he? And I said, Well, his father. The father he's, he's, yeah, he's a father. He's big. He's bigger than you. And uh, he was, as a matter of fact. He said, and, uh, he saw, well, all right. He says, now, you know, you have to decide what kind of pipe goes with the kind of man. Is he, is he tall and thin? Is he, is he wide? So, well, he's kind of thin. He's tall, sort of. And so he says, ah, here, I have just the pipe for him. So he goes back, and he has them all on a wall. He takes a pipe, and it's oh, beautiful pipes. Oh, beautiful polished. He shows it to me. He says, do you think he'd like that one? I look at him, he says, uh, uh, it, it should be a little longer. I was trying to get him one like in the pictures. He says, a little longer. He says, oh, well, I see. You want a, you want a slightly longer stem. That's called a stem. Well, all right. Here, here we have another one. This is another, the Regency model. And he takes another one. He shows it to me. I look down. He says, that, 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 that's, that's really just about right. And Flick says, oh, that's, be, that's great looking. That's great looking. So I says, well, I don't know. I don't know. I'll think about it. The greatest bestsellers. Books like Rebecca, Exodus, Hawaii. You don't just read them, you live them. Beulah Land by Lonnie Coleman is that kind of book. A sensational bestseller compared by many to God with the Wind. But Beulah Land is so frank it could only be published in our time. Beulah Land, the story of a great plantation in all its outward splendor and secret shame. Beulah Land, a Dell paperback bestseller. Oh, yes, Beulah Land, that sounds exciting. And here's another Dell book, The Onion Field, by Joseph Wambaugh. Real life suspense bestseller, now available through Dell's. And by the way, so is Wanda Hickey's Night of Golden Memories. Yeah, anywhere they sell Dell books, you ask for it. Pick it up. I'll just throw that in there. But you know, while we're... I, I, I don't want to even remember it now, now that I think back on it. I don't really... Should I tell you the rest of the story? Well, how much time do we have? How much? Four minutes. Well, you can hit us with a couple of those, and then, oh, I've got time. The story comes to a, a quick but... Uh, a uh, tragic end. If you're heading for La Paz or Rio, this message about Americana Hotel's flagship Rochester may have to wait. But if it's Niagara Falls you're heading for, or Canada, or New York's wine country, or the Finger Lakes, this message about flagship Rochester is for you. First thing you'll notice as you drive up is that we're right in the middle of all the good things in Rochester. Near the Kodak facilities, the photography museum, the harness racing. Next thing you'll notice is all the fun in our pool, and how nice the place looks, and how pleasant our restaurants are. We can arrange a three-day, two-night playaway plan for just $29 per person, double occupancy. If you're heading west for the gold rush, good luck. But if you're in our neighborhood, stay with us at the flagship Rochester. Well, uh, 
let's see, as everybody looks back towards 1975, New York Magazine looks back at 1949, the year we entered modern times. It's an interesting concept. Arthur Miller writes how it was when Death of a Salesman opened. And uh, Betty Friedan describes the 1949 housewife herself. So uh, all this stuff, uh, the great uh, year-end issue of uh, New York Magazine is on sale. It's the year-end double issue. And by the way, speaking of uh, curious uh, issues, uh, one of the very first records that I, in fact, the first record that I ever made called Into the Unknown with Jazz Music, <laughs> a corny title, will be heard on WNYC December 25th at 11 a.m. So if you're around at 11 a.m., that's Christmas Day, listen to WNYC at 11 o'clock in the morning. That's both a.m. and f.m. WNYC a.m., rather, Wednesday, December 25th at 11. Gramercy Park Close of 61 West 23rd Street says, Everybody but everybody must have seen the article in the newspaper about saving money on men's clothing. Gramercy Park hasn't seen so many people coming to buy clothes in its 78 years of manufacturing. It took a major newspaper article to explain how Gramercy Park sells fine quality clothing to men who won't pay high prices. If you want good-looking clothes without paying high prices, do this. Go to the sixth floor of the factory building at 61 West 23rd Street. Try on all the new styles, the suits, the cashmere overcoats, the imported tweed sport coats, the slacks. Far, far better clothing than you thought you could get for this type of money. There's no obligation, and credit cards are okay. The address is Gramercy Park Clothes, 61 West 23rd Street, 61 West 23rd Street, New York. And this guy looked at me and he said, how much do you have to spend? And I said, well, how much is this pipe? He says, well, this is uh, 1750. 1750. <laughs> I couldn't conceive of a, of a pipe costing $17 and 50 cents. I mean, in fact, I couldn't conceive of $17 and 50 cents. Seventeen fifty? Yes. It's a very nice pipe, though. I'm sure your father would really like it. I said, Do you have any other ones that aren't as expensive? He says, Well, yes, of course. And he reaches back and he shows all these. This one is only twelve dollars. Only twelve dollars. I said, That's a very nice pipe. He said, Well, how much can you spend? And I said. Uh, well, uh, now I'm panicky. I realize this. And here was Schwartz. Here was here was Flick. And I said, well, I, I could spend a dollar. We said, well, why didn't you say so? We have, we have just exactly what you want. And he, he goes in the back and he comes back out and he's got a big cardboard box. <laughs> he says, here's, here's a pipe. He says, a beautiful pipe. And this pipe is only 99 cents. They're on sale now. And by that time, I'm so totally demoralized that I am not about to say it's got a too short stem. I want one with a, you know, I says, that's, that's okay. That's, that's nice. He says, very good. Shall I wrap it for you? And I says, yeah, yeah. And so he wrapped it in Christmas paper. And I took my 99 cent pen back out into the street and... Schwartz and Flick says, boy, I never knew that the pipes cost that much. I said, well, you know, it's Christmas. I'll give something really good to my father. And I can recall that Christmas morning when the old man opened up the pipe. I figured this is the biggest thing he's ever got, you know, since the time he bowled 300. <laughs> you know? And, you know, he really played it that way. He says, oh, just what I've always wanted, a pipe. Oh, Wow. It had never occurred to me to ask myself whether or not my father smoked the pipe or whether he even... Somehow, a father should have a pipe. At least that's what the ad said. He says, isn't that nice? Why, that's really nice. That's really nice. That's a really nice pipe. I said, here, uh, see, here's the way you put it. You put it in your mouth like this. He says, oh, yes. Oh, that's very interesting. It's got a mouthpiece. Look at you. It's got a thing you... Very nice. 